good morning still. Welcome to uh, Let's Talk Property and the masterclass that we're going to be running through today. I see that uh, all of the guys from my side are popping onto the screen, so hopefully we'll get everybody across. We're going to be running through a very interesting 45 minutes now and looking at uh, at finding your property, pricing and location. And I think if you look back at the, the two pieces of um, of the seminar that went through this morning, it was something that Samuel C. spoke about, about how important location is. And uh, his bit of wisdom at the time was to find the, the worst house and the best streets and buy that one. And then he went across to Tim. Tim was saying that not all houses are created equal, so make sure that the location that you're buying in is, uh, is, is looked at and is important. I'm joined with uh, some real experts on the, on, on the line today. I want to start off by just sort of welcoming everybody. So I'm not going to let them do their own welcome. I'm going to welcome them on their, on their behalf. I better welcome Haley from Lightstone. Lightstone is a is a product that uh, all estate agents use on a day-to-day -day basis. It's the, it's a it's sort of Bible and go-to sort of space to go and have a look at some of the stats. And it really is something that we that we use on a day-to-day -day basis. So I look forward to having Haley on the panel today and so having some discussions with her. Michelle from TPN, uh, somebody who's been with us uh, over many, many of these webinars and gives massive insights into the stats and really gives some great insights. And I've always, I've always enjoyed having Michelle on the panel from her, from her side. Andrew from EXP. Andrew's uh, launched a, a new product and I know that they do quite well in South Africa and I'm sure he's going to allude to a bit of it just now, but his insight in this market is massive and he'll give, he will give great insight into first-time buyers and what's happening in and around the country in that particular space. Um, if I look across, we've got Rob Vesselow from IHS and Rob and them have got a product that really, really works well in this space in a number of different areas and we look forward to uh, some impact from, from him. Matthew from um, Aquacore Development, they do project sourcing and a whole lot of stuff from their side, so they'll give us massive insight into the, the developments from their side. Mark from Concor, uh, more from a construction point of view, but let's uh, get straight into it and sort of start speaking to everybody and let's find out exactly why pricing and location is an important part. If I can sort of just paint the picture and I'm going to drop it into to Michelle as the first uh, person and I'm going to drop some, some questions onto you. But Michelle, I mean, uh, when you're looking at location and pricing, I mean, apart from the fact that you want to be close to work, close to schools, shops, growth, future growth, crime and safety, those are just some of the elements that we're going to be looking at. Could you give our listeners some idea um, of why location is such an important part when buying a property? Um, uh, thanks, Eugene. Yeah, so I guess the, the real question is when you're buying a property, what is the objective for buying it? Um, if, if the objective is um, because it's going to be your primary residence, then the considerations around location is how long is it going to get me to uh, uh, drive to work, drive to school, um, uh, get to the shops, um, etc. If your um, primary purpose for buying is from a buy to let perspective, well, then your location is all about your returns, etc. If your location is because I'm investing in property for a holiday investment, well, then you're going to look at it from that perspective. So, Eugene, for me, it's about what is your objective for why you are buying um, and then determining your location as a result of that. And, and then we get into all the fun stuff, which is the, the pricing um, and, um, and, and the qualification around that location. Thank you, Michelle. That is a great, succinct way to put it. Andrew, I'm going to drop across to you just from a pricing point of view. I mean, pricing in the market space is, 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 a, is a little bit sort of weird at the moment. You know? so should people be looking at per square meter pricing? Should they be looking at the total pricing? How do they look, what, is the, what is the comparisons that people should be using when making a decision around pricing for their properties? Yeah, Eugene, I, I really think it goes back to location and uh, quite an interesting subject at the present moment is obviously the virtual opportunity. Uh, people are looking at housing opportunities, development opportunities, and I think there's going to be a massive movement down to the coastal areas because people can effectively work from wherever they wish to. So we've got to take that into consideration. But certainly, uh, if we do look at development stock as an example, I would look at a, an earth if you're buying land directly from a developer. I'd look at a price per square meter option and do comparisons in the area in comparison to other developments in that space. I know across the whole of South Africa, the average house price is around about 800,000 Rand. But if you move into areas like Mschlange, you're looking at average house price at around about the 1.8, 1.9 million Rand mark. And funny enough, up in the Belito area, I was chatting to a real estate agent up there yesterday. Pricing's coming in on average around about the 3 million Rand mark. And I think if, if you just look from a regional point of view, uh, obviously you draw down and dig down into 
the square meterage of that particular product, whether it's sectional title or whether it's standalone freehold homes that you're looking at, but that will dictate the value that you're gonna realize. What I think people are, are really looking at at the moment is how much productivity they can get out of their home per square meter. And uh, I loved the session earlier with uh, Tim Akinusi, uh, where he spoke about your home being an, an asset of difference at the present moment, where you live, work, play, pray, stay, uh, from looking at fiber to Wi-Fi to green technology. And I think anyone looking at building a brand new home should certainly take that into consideration because it's not only now bricks and mortar, it's about the added value that comes with that home that's going to make your decision as well. Thank you, Andrew. Rob, I'm going to move across to you now. Rob, from a, from a, a, a sales point of view and the, and the product that's out there at the moment, what sort of pressure are you guys feeling in terms of trying to get the pricing right? You know, is it, is it an open gate market at the moment where, uh, you know, you can sort of go in there and the price that you want to determine and get out there is easily got and, 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 and sort of obtained by the market? Or is there a bit of a fight back that you're feeling from the market at the moment in terms of pricing? Uh, so thanks. Uh, you know, I mean, as IHS, we've always tried to operate in what we call the affordable market. And, and that market typically for us is, you know, an entry price point between sort of 500 and eight, 900,000 Rand. And we have found, you know, over many years that uh, the more we can stay within that band, the more demand there is for the product, whether it's a, a, a for sale uh, product or for rental, because a lot of investors buy products to, to rent them out. And if you, you know, paying, you know, Michelle will have all the stats on her fingertips, but, you know, in that 4,000 to seven, 8,000 Rand a month rental band, there's a lot of demand. So if you, Buying as an investor, you know, we always try and stay in that band. I think the, uh, you know, price is king at the moment. So there's no doubt whether you're buying or whether you're selling, price point is, is, is literally everything. And obviously it's price for the product in the location. So the best price for the best product in the best location. That doesn't mean, you know, it needs to be in the very high end. The high end of the market is struggling at the moment. In the more affordable space, uh, it's been a little bit more resilient. I think if you're a first time home uh, buyer in the current market, you have some opportunities that, you know, frankly, haven't been there for quite a while. The product innovation at the moment is, you know, I think you're as good as it's ever been and, and better than it's ever been. And in some cases, our environment is dictate, dictating that and the price point is dictating that. So you now you get some much smaller, funkier product where you have, uh, you know, your own space that is perhaps you know, smaller than what you would typically be buying, but with some amazing shared space and amenities. I actually took occupation of an apartment on Monday in, in Cape Town that uh, I bought for my youngest daughter to occupy when she's at university next year. And it's very small and funky, but, you know, the shared amenities are, are fantastic. You know, everything from a roof garden to a swimming pool to Wi-Fi rooms to you know, laundry, you know, th those kinds of things. I think, you know, certainly when I was a first time buyer, which was very long ago, uh, those, those types of options and those amenities just didn't exist. So coming back to the price per square meter point, you might pay a lot m more per square meter of, of, uh, of use for your own self. But, uh, you know, the other amenities that you get make it worth it. So I think it's a very exciting time to be a first time buyer. Well, I couldn't agree more, I think, with, uh, with all the stuff and the stock that's out there. And we've got to spend a bit of time on stock. But before we go there, um, Mark, from your side, I mean, as a, from a construction point of view, the, the pressure that you guys are sort of feeling just from, from a building point of view in terms of what you guys have to do for the costing, is that pressure felt all the way down in terms of how you guys are having to apply uh, you know, the, the cost to build per square meter, making sure that you're living with the stuff that Rob's talking about. You know, when you open up into, into what's happening in those open spaces, you've got to deliver a product that still looks good at a price that still makes sense. You know, how are you guys dealing with that, that, that sort of setup and how are you applying yourselves to, to, to those sort of builds? So, yeah, Eugene, I, I think um, it, it, it is an interesting and exciting time that we're in, in, in the construction sector. But I definitely see everyone coming to the party in terms of that entire supply chain. You know, it, it, price point is so critical at this point. And uh, your, your first question that you asked about uh, what's more important, price point or per square meter? For, for me, both are important. You know, the, the price point opens you up to a certain amount of market, but you also need to be getting value for money 
I think that's important. So that price per, per square meter is just critically important. And what we're finding is, is um, it is difficult out there, but everyone is coming to the party in terms of the supply chain. And, and I think purchases now are getting probably the best value for money that I've seen in the last five or 10 years, because um, it, there is a lot of competition and, um, and yeah, we're all there trying to create a great product. Absolutely, and I think that what you, if you look at what is out there in the marketplace, just from, from, from what product looks like and the price and you're getting, there's a massive amount of choice. Matthew, from your side, when you're looking at project sourcing and the spaces and places to really get out and, 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 and deliver some of these developments, you know, from, uh, from, 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 uh, Concours, uh, from Concours side, uh, from uh, Aquacore side, from your, your point of view, what are you doing to make sure that when you're doing project sourcing that you're making sure that you are able to deliver with what we're talking about from a pricing point and making sure that, you know, wherever these, these developments are getting put out, that there is good usage and good purchasing power from, from, from uh, the market. Yeah, thanks for that, Eugene. Um, you know, I just want to echo what the guys have said about rate versus price point. I always say that you start with price point because what you can afford is what you can afford. So if you've got a million rand, that's where you start. Once you've got a whole bunch of options at a million rand, you then look at the rate per square meter. That's how you compare apples with apples. Once you've got your rate per square meter comparison, then you go, what is the cost of buying this place? And people don't think about that because if you and your partner both need cars and you need to be in them for an hour and a half a day, you have to add the cost of buying the car and the petrol and the hour and a half at your hourly rate to the cost of the place you've just bought. That's the real cost of the place you bought. If you then compare that opportunity to somewhere that's closer to your work where potentially your partner or you can lose one of the vehicles, you take that off the cost of the place you've just bought. You also take off the hours that you're on commuting. So what we sometimes do, which is a false, um, a false advantage, is you find a cheap property out in the sticks, but you don't take in the fact that you and your partner might be driving three hours a day, cumulatively 15 hours a week, and racking up a couple of grand a month on vehicles and transport. That money would be better on your bond and you'd be investing quicker. So, you know, what I say to new time buyers is I always say there's a culture that we have to break this culture of young buyers believing that they should have a house in the suburbs. That paradigm often is a very expensive, costly paradigm. In the short term, you should be investing in high rate per square meter, high yield properties in your younger years. I would only look at going to do the suburban model in your late 30s, early 40s, by which time your property must actually be earning you money. Very, very good point. And I think it's a great time to bring Haley in from, from Lightstone. Um, you know, Lightstone as a, as a whole, is, as, a, as I sort of intimated at the beginning, is something that we use to, to measure against our stats. What are, are you seeing um, the trend that everyone is speaking to from, from, from where they're purchasing, how they're purchasing, and what they're purchasing at the moment? And I think, you know, if we look at the whole, the, the whole, the whole seminar for today, it really is, a, I mean, it's aimed at the first time home buyer. It really is where there's a huge amount of traction in the market. Um, there may be reasons behind it, and I know when we moved to Michelle after, she's, she's given us some great insights over the last couple of weeks, and, I'm, and I, will be, I will ask her to come back onto that after this. But Hayley, from your side, are these trends aligning with what you guys are seeing statistically on your side? Uh, definitely. Thanks, Eugene. Um, I think what we're seeing is definitely an uptick in the market and the activity, something that was really not anticipated. I think when we entered in the COVID and all of the lockdown, there was a real sense in the market that we we're heading for some real doom and gloom. We've come out of it and there's a lot of activity. So we're seeing it on our system. There's a lot of properties being sold. We're seeing the average price on first time home buyers being between 700K and a million as, gen as the general price. The interesting piece for us there, the standout is Cape Town. So Cape Town, the average price is 1.5 million up in terms of first time home buyers, which is interesting. Another little interesting snippet around first-time home buyers is 51% are women, uh, it's female. So also another interesting little um, snippet that we can, we can look at. And then obviously, you know, looking at bonds and, and where bonds are being taken up, it's, it's very much on the average of over 70%. Obviously at the moment, you know, with the interest rate, this is such a good time to buy. And I think a lot of people are reflecting on that and kind of saying, you know, I should actually be buying as opposed to renting. This is very affordable. Um, and I think we're seeing a lot of that. We're seeing also just in types of properties um, being bought. First time home buyers are the majority are three bedroom homes, which is really interesting. Um, you always kind of expect it's the bachelor pad that gets taken up in first time home buyers. So we're seeing the three bedroom is the most um, being bought. 
So, so interesting um, leverages coming through and obviously certain areas that are being highlighted. Um, interesting where also where there's a lot of sectional title. I think that links in very much with the price points within the certain suburbs and areas that are obviously affordable uh, for people wanting to buy first time ho homes. I think also the nature of where we are is people are rethinking to a couple of points that have been raised. You don't need to be in an office anymore. We're seeing, we're seeing a movement down to the coast. We're seeing people saying, we don't need to be there at the office. We can actually go and work where we want to work and touch, touch points or every couple of weeks where we need to. So we, we're seeing that. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of um, talk as well around the fact that if you've got a property with a flatlet, it's, it's really a good thing to have at this point to sell. Um, you'll get um, extra value on that. So yeah, there's lots of um, pieces we're seeing in the market and definitely an uptick at the moment. So long may it last. Um, I think it's really great for the estate agent world. Absolutely. Um, we, we, on one of the, the, the webinars they were talking about in the first time home buyer, the, the, the reason for some of those extended buyers in the, in the houses is that there were extended families that were, that were sort of uh, relocating to those areas as one to sort of, sort of pool the resources. And be that as it may, I think it starts to make sense in terms of what the market looks like in this space. And entering the market is, is not that easy. Michelle, I'm going to go across to you. I mean, this is something that you've definitely highlighted for us over the last while, you know, um, with the focus being uh, historically around rental and obviously tying in the stats into where we are, that movement where, where people were in the rental space historically and are now able at the same sort of price to look at purchasing. How, how is that affecting the market? Is that a genuine move? And is that something that still is there that, that sort of stayed over the last six or seven months when we saw this massive move? Yeah, so if I look back at the data um, and we look at the average age um, of a tenant, and we've watched over the last 12 years how the tenants have just remained in rental accommodation. And so by that, I mean, we're looking at um, splitting the, the tenants into um, three-year buckets. And we see that it's the same tenants. That bucket of tenant just gets older and older and older. It's, not, it, it's the same group of tenants just remaining in, um, in rental accommodation. Right up until the point that we were sitting at our average age of tenants was uh, kind of reaching 38 years um, of age. And this tells us that people weren't moving out of rental accommodation and they were remaining in, sorry, weren't moving out of rental accommodation into um, first time home buying. And for the first time this year, we've started to see that shift. From a rental perspective, we've started to see the age um, uh, decline, decrease back as those 38 year olds finally uh, pick up and start moving into um, home ownership, which is fantastic. But what a, what a first time home buyer needs at the age of 38 is different to what a first time home buyer needs at the age of 27, which is what was happening 10, 12 um, years ago. So we, 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 um, we surveyed our, our tenants and said, if you were to move into first time home buying, what is it that would be important for you? So if you want to remain in rental, what is important for you? And if you're going to move into first time home buying, what is important for you? Um, and the data that came back was fascinating. So for our tenants, they said it's about price points. Number one for us is how much it's going to cost us. That is what is going to determine where we uh, rent. And number four, two for us is uh, security. For first time home buyers, for our tenants moving into home ownership, number one, 70% responded and said security is, is key critical for us. This is our most important factor that we're going to um, um, look at. And number two, we're going to look at size. And um, again, speaking to what the other panelists are saying, with regards to we're going to do work from home, um, then we want to have home offices. We want to have um, the opportunity to do more with the size of our property. Again, I think that's an affordability um, uh, perspective. Because if you're 38, this is something that you can grapple with or play with. If you're 27, it's, it's all about, you know, what can I afford to get into? Um, and I'm limited in terms of, of what I can afford to get into. And number three, it's the, um, the quality of the suburb. So for tenants moving into first time home buying, the quality of the suburb is quite important. And then coming at a number four and five is distance from uh, school and work. So how far is it going to, what is it going to uh, cost me in terms of um, travel? Okay, I'm going, to, I'm going to pop across to Andrew. Andrew, uh, you, you've uh, sort of alluded to the fact that there's good movement down to the south, uh, down, the, down to the coastal areas. There's also been a little bit of a stat around what's been happening in the gated community. It's really support, supported by some of the stats that Michelle's given us and probably some of the stuff that Haley will be able to give us in terms of 
the benefits of buying in a gated community. We've also seen that first time home buyers are buying in those particular areas, notwithstanding the levies and all the things that go with this. Is that something that you guys are seeing at a, at a practical level in the market now as well? Is that, is that are first time home buyers finding access to get into gated communities? And what is your reference that you can give on the ground? Eugene, you know, I've been involved in the development side of things and previously with the Eland Property Group for the last 15 years. So I already know between Durban Richards Bank and Shark Tank National Airport in particular. So from a secure lifestyle point of view, I think uh, this is sort of becoming the kingpin of the, 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 the lifestyle estates along this north coast area. And what's great about the developers is they're offering a really good entry level stock. Uh, smaller properties, I think of Zululami the other day, I think 108 sites sold out in one night, uh, in one day. Uh, the success of Blytheo Coastal Estate uh, in terms of the entry level stock. And I think you know my philosophy on the developments is buy the entry level stock. Get in there early, you're getting loan to values of around about 85%. And that entry level stock, the minute you get into that stock, you've got the ability to realize and see the development grow around you. So gate houses go up, fence lines go up, infrastructure comes in, et cetera. And what I love about new developments is it gives you a guarantee of infrastructure and bulk services into the future. And that's the reliability that you want. You also want to go into neighborhoods where you know who is your neighbor, what's the growth in the area, what's coming in from a facilities point of view, what's the prop, uh, promise in terms of infrastructure, and what's the sort of government spend coming into those areas to ensure the bulk utilities are there forever going forward? So for me, very exciting about the development side of things. I love the development uh, portion of uh, purchasing. I think it's a, a great for young investors uh, in terms of getting into that space. But I do go back to the first time homeowner who wants to secure a small property, build a small home, make sure it's a productive home because you're going to get the best return on that over a short to long period of time. Thanks very much, Eugene. Thanks, Andrew. Um, Rob, if we, look at, if we look at your side and just some of the guidance that you could give first-time buyers, if we're looking at first-time buyers that are, that are looking at uh, sectional title versus freehold, is there some input or access that you could, or information that you could give to, to the, the listeners in terms of, uh, you know, how to approach that from a sectional title versus freehold? Look, I think that, you know, and a couple of people have touched on it, um, from a locality point of view and a transport cost and being close to existing and coming infrastructure, you know, generally sectional title schemes and, and you know, th there's a lot of interesting stuff happening uh, with uh, refurbed office accommodation and the like at the moment. Yeah, we're in a situation where uh, we have a shortage of infrastructure in this country. So to be able to move into an area where infrastructure already exists is a saving from a price point point of view and also from a time point of view. So we're seeing some really interesting office redevelopments in, in areas where you wouldn't have seen that. You know, we've seen it in the CBD of Johannesburg and Cape Town and other areas for a long time. But now you're starting to see office parks empty out in areas like Sunning Hill north of Johannesburg, um, in, in areas like Santon even. You know, there's some some great uh, office refurbs going on in the Santa area that are being sold for a price point of less than a million rand. Um, so I think those kinds of opportunities allow you to be you know, closer to, to business districts and infrastructure, retail infrastructure, um, than, than, than you would typically be if you were buying in a, a large estate that might be a little bit further out. So they, they give you different kinds of opportunities. It depends what, uh, what you're looking for. Some of the larger states, particularly some of those on the North Coast, um, uh, de develop with the infrastructure, with the schools that are close by and within the estates, um, with the shopping infrastructure, so that you don't have to travel out of that environment. And you know, it is an interesting time where people are learning whether or not they can uh, stay away from the office, how long can it last. I have my own view on this, that people are still going to have to go to the office. Um, you know, It's all very well going into a COVID lockdown where you have a team that has gelled and has uh, a culture um, but you know if you stay if you stay working at home for the next three years um, it's going to be difficult to maintain that culture and, uh, and 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 the like so you know i do think things will change i don't think we'll all have to jump into our cars at the same time every day anymore or morning and night 
Um, but, but I think the office will remain an important part of, of the way we operate. But I think just about everybody uh, is now set up at home. So again, going back to the little apartment that I took transfer of on, uh, on Monday, it's uh, 55 square meters, but it has a built-in desk. You know, it anticipates that somebody is going to work from there. And I think uh, the, the new product that's being developed anticipates that. It, it, it imagines that we are going to work from home at least some of the time. Um, you know, there's a lot of information available. So, you know, we've got two of the best sources of the information on this panel uh, between Lighthouse and, and, and TPN. We, we use that information. If we're going to go and spend, you know, three, 400 million uh, rand on a development, which we're either going to sell or we're going to rent out, we want to know what is happening in that area. We want to know uh, what infrastructure is coming into that area. We want to know what the price points are. We want to know what the comparisons are. Um, you've got an interesting uh, dilemma as a first time buyer in the current environment because uh, to buy an existing house is going to be, from a price per square meter point of view, much cheaper than buying a new build. But, you know, I think we've seen a product change materially. So, you know, you walk into a new build today and you know you've got Wi-Fi that's operational. You know you've got all the necessary cable that's plug and play. You know you've got state-of-the-art security. Uh, the technology is right up there. You know, camera looking down to the entrance and the like. The older houses aren't, aren't, aren't wide for this, you know. So I do think that um, price point isn't the only thing we need to look at. Also, you know, Michelle mentioned security. You know, the, the way the technology has developed and, 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 and security has developed, the, you know, the new properties that we build, even in a very affordable space, um, we're able to put that state-of-the-art uh, security and communication network in place, which I think is very important. Thank you very much. And I think you bring a huge amount of points to the table there. And to a couple of that, I do want to move across to, to Mark and Matthew. So starting with Mark, um, Rob, Rob mentioned uh, uh, the size of the space that he's in there at 55 squares. What, 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 are the, what are the sizes that you guys are sort of looking at into this entry market now uh, in, in, terms of, uh, in terms of the build? What is, is there an ideal size or is it really dependent on, on, on the zoning that you got and trying to ensure that you're getting maximum usage from that land? So Eugene, um, you know, there's been a lot of talk and a lot of testing the market with these new types of uh, micro units and that. But uh, us personally, I, I'm not a, a believer of those. I don't think, um, you know, yes, it does come down to price point, but trying to get someone to live in an 18 square meter or 25 square meter shoebox, um, especially in these tough times with COVID, I, I don't think it's, it's sustainable. So we, we try not to go under the 30 square meter mark. I think um, a 30 square meter studio is, is a livable unit. You know, I'm a, I'm a prime example of, I've, I've been living in apartments for the last uh, 15 years and I'm still living in an apartment, um, coming to you from working from home today. Um, so, so yeah, it, it's an important aspect. And so we try to, to err on the bigger side, but um, very mindful of those price points that we've been talking about where, where once you reach a certain, uh, element then then it just you you lose a massive amount of the market so it's a fine balance but i think with some clever out the box thinking you you can make both work okay thank you now matthew from a finishes point of view i mean uh, rob was alluding to the the the, the alignment of having fiber and everything in homes at the moment and you know that's a, that's probably one of the benefits of buying a new build as opposed to not but from a finishers point of view, what are the what are the things that you guys are adding, making sure is in the in those developments? You know, you know I don't know, it's the one plus one uh, uh, sort of fridge and stove, and what what are those elements of finishes that you guys are trying to enforce and still into into the builds? Thanks, Eugene. Um, there's a comment Mark made on the panel last week: uh, sleep small and live big, and I think that's very much a move at the moment. Um, we're looking at people's living spaces really as being a place. And, and I literally sell it like this. I say, the flat we're going into is a glorified kitchen, toilet, bedroom. You make food there, you get rid of the food in eight hours time and you sleep in between. It's kind of rough, but that's the reality of modern living. Now, let's take all of those extra little spaces that we were building for you in the past and let's stockfill them into one beautiful community center, which is now giving you a lounge, which is better than the lounge you've ever afforded a home office, which is a real home office and is five minutes from your unit, a creche, an aftercare, a gym. So this is also where, 
you know, I, I find that if you look at modern and well-designed developments, there's no comparison to a standalone home because we're giving people in a secure quasi suburb environment, everything which would customarily have been in a little town. Uh, you have to realize the South African condition that for the foreseeable future, it's safer to work on the assumption that security won't be there, services won't be there, maybe even education won't be there. Rather work on that assumption and then look for developments that give you all that stuff. We can now give people kitchens in the straddling a million rand range, which we couldn't afford to put into Atlantic Seaboard homes five years ago. So the material quality is increasing at a radical rate. Exactly what Rob said. We're giving people free fiber, free data now. Um, the security that we can do in a complex compared to what you can do in a private home, it's, it, it isn't even a comparison. So really going into the sectional title space, going into these larger developments, especially with a well-known brand, you're getting a level of security that you're just not going to get in a standalone home. And security doesn't just mean razor wire. It means will electricity work? Will the water work? Is my garden going to be clean? Will they paint the outside of the property? Will the crash actually be accredited? There's so many little factors that you have to think about. And we as developers are thinking about that on the behalf of the client. If you try to recreate the space that we are creating in new developments in the private, in the private environment, by the time you add on all the things that we're giving you, your cheaper house in the burbs, probably half the cost of an equivalent sectional title unit, once you add on the crash and the security and the transport and the time, so definitely what you're getting bang for buck right now. I haven't even touched on the fact that you get a three to five year warranty from most developers, which you don't get in a private home. So it's like your, your house comes with a motor plan. <laughs> a very good way to put it. Thank you, Matthew. Hayley, um, just from, from, from what you're seeing at the moment, if you could look into the crystal ball of stats around uh, all the things that you have and you could give insight as to where you believe or see i mean you did mention that cape town was sort of shooting the lights out at the moment is there in that crystal ball of stats that you guys see uh, some growth areas that you would highlight for for some of the listeners at the moment that, that they could look at or should look at um, and i'm not trying to put you on the spot it's really just going to be a, a, an educated guess in terms of the the stats that you have out there I see Michelle's always smiling because she realizes that she, she plans all these little questions in advance with me because she kind of has worked with me on a few of these. But if you mm -hmm. can help us on that, Hayley, please. For sure. So, Eugene, there's obviously pockets of activity across the country, and it's obviously where pro properties are being bought at by first-time buyers. We obviously have a list of suburbs where we're seeing the most activity in certain uh, metropolitan areas. Um, and also, obviously, nationally, we also have a sense in terms of where that's happening. That is obviously also linked, I want to just say, to life stage and what people can afford and what we're seeing being bought up. It's also obviously linked to developments that are possibly happening in an area where there's lots of purchasing happening. So if we just look at some areas in Cape Town, there's um, places like Belhar, Plumstead, Observatory, Seapoint, Weinberg. Those are kind of the top suburbs first-time home buyers are buying into at the moment. Um, in Durban, we have um, Bulwa, Chesterville, Morningside, Reservoir Hills, Musgrave, so very much your Berea area. And Johannesburg, it's your Kensington, Lombardy East, Orange Grove, Glen Vista, Winchester Hills. That seem to be the areas that are picking up the most, most of first-time home buyers at the moment, um, if we're looking at locality. So, yeah, and across, across the country, there's obviously a national view as well, but linked again, once again, to affordability and the price bands where people are actually buying and what, what they can afford and linking to life stage. Thank you. Those, those are awesome sort of alignments back to you to, the, to actual genuine suburbs, which is always nice. So we've got about nine minutes left. I'm going to see if, if we can in about a minute and a half sort of wrap up everything from everyone's side. I'm going to start with Michelle. If you can, Michelle, just in, the, in, in one and a half minutes or so, if you could just give us your view on finding a property pricing and location, if you could just give us your wrap of uh, what you believe our listeners should be looking out for, what they can apply, or any real sort of gems of tidbits that you can offer the, the, the listener. Um, Eugene, I'm going to tackle this from a credit bureau perspective as opposed to a property analyst uh, perspective. And I'm going to tackle it from your credit profile and what you need to do to prepare yourself um, as a first time um, home buyer. If you haven't gone and got a copy of your free credit report, absolutely go and do that to make sure that your credit profile is uh, ready to go. If there's any information on there, because really um, you'd be surprised at how much information the bureaus actually have on you. 
Um, and if, um, if you have any information on your profile that um, you feel is, is not fa fairly reflective, um, you have the opportunity to dispute it uh, with the Bureau. So I would absolutely start at that point. And the second point I would caution everyone towards is um, on budgeting. So everyone's alluded to your affordability. It's key critical um, at the moment. Interest rates are the lowest they've been in 55 years. 7%, um, that's absolutely fabulous. But when you're doing your calculations, and the banks are going to do it in any event, pop on an extra 3% and make sure that you still have the affordability to, um, to, to continue to, to pay your, um, your, your, your bond repayments at that kind of price. So give yourself a little bit of a, a breathing space. Michelle, thank you as always. Andrew, over to you. If you can uh, just give your little rep from, from your side, please. Eugene, you know, I, I think it goes back to the early bird uh, gets in early. So the earlier you get in, not only on resale stock, if you see it's available, there's no better time to buy than now. And uh, also refer to developer stock. If you get into developments in the early phases, you're holding your price for a long period of time at a reduced value at a very small deposit. That's a great opportunity in terms of accessing development stock to build that uh, small productive home as a first time home homeowner. What I also highly recommend is know your neighbor, know your surrounds, understand the infrastructure, understand what's happening in your area, where the retail's going, where the school's going, uh, where, where the hospitals are going, because those are effectively essential services uh, for you and your family. And just a slightly different angle, I don't think anyone's really mentioned it today, but you know, to be wealthy in life, there's the talk of uh, working seven different, seven different ways of earning. And uh, one of my recommendations, and it hasn't been mentioned today, is consider becoming an estate agent. Because if you become an estate agent, you've got the ability to ensure that the commission comes to you on that home. And already that's a reduction in terms of the price and the, the value of that particular home. So EXP, South Africa, uh, we've just launched, and we're offering agents four different ways of earning. And possibly the fifth different way of earning is through that commission structure when buying your first home. So sincerely, I did post it on, on the, the panel discussion earlier. You can access our join app uh, through, through the link that I've sent. And uh, we're just so proud to be part of uh, Let's Talk Property. Thanks to you, Eugene and to Mark Taylor. It's been a wonderful experience together with the other panelists. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you for, um, for always being available for us when we need you. Rob, from your side, I mean, you've given some massive insights already in terms of, uh, in, in terms of the first-time homeowners market. It is, it is a space that you guys understand and play exceptionally well in. Uh, if you could just give us a few gems from your side, it'll also help. Thank you. Uh, th thanks, Eugene. Yeah, I, I think it's a great time to, to be a first-time uh, buyer. Obviously, the economy is struggling and a lot of people are, are losing jobs, but there is still demand, strong demand for quality, affordable housing. I'm a big believer, you know, and the sooner you start, the better. Uh, you know, property is a gearable asset and it's a hard asset. A car is also a gearable asset, but it's a waste of money. I often have uh, this discussion with some of my younger staff to say, don't fall into the trap. Don't go and buy the fancy car that's going to lose 30% of its value as you drive it up the, up, up the showroom. Focus on a quality, hard asset like, like property that you can own for a long time and you will create wealth. Um, so there's some amazing products around at the moment, some affordable product, you know, in the old days, affordable stuff was, was built ugly. You know, that's not the case anymore. There's great affordable, funky product around in really good areas. And, uh, and you can really do a whole lot worse than investing in your first home, even if you're not staying at it, even if you still have the luxury of being able to live with parents or, or the likes, uh, you know, uh, build it and, and rent it out, but do your research. You know, make sure you know what's going on in the area. If you're buying into a sectional type of development, ma make sure you understand the management and, and, and you know, go in eyes wide open. Good luck. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, what a great analogy around the car. I think there's a whole lot of uh, car salespeople that are absolutely hating you right now in this conversation. They're going, 
we try to also recover from COVID. So if you can just help with us ourselves, but I absolutely agree with you. When you're looking at the pricing of cars at the moment, and uh, it's not a long-term investment. It's actually just something that needs to be a workhorse for you. So what a great analogy. Mark, I'm going to move over to you. If you can just give us a little bit of a wrap from your point of view and uh, give us a little bit more insight into what's going to be happening for you guys in the next while. Yeah, thanks, Eugene. Um, I, I do think this is the time to, to get involved. And, and I'm going to stick to the, the age-old analogy of, of focus on location. Um, don't necessarily look for the worst property in, in the best location. But if you get your location right, you know, you so far uh, advance in terms of, of all the things that Matthew talked about in terms of travel time to work, having the ability to spend more time with your family, knowing your neighbors, having the amenities near you. So, so for us, location is key. And, and, and yeah, the, the other thing is now take the first step. You know, we, we're all so busy in our daily lives and take the time, do your research and get onto that property ladder because now is the time. You know, we, we hopefully, uh, hoping and praying that there might be another slight interest rate cut. And, um, you know, yes, factor in that safety, factor in that safety in your, in your budgeting but take advantage of this, this situation because uh, the opportunity is, is amazing. Thank you, Mark. And again, I don't think we'll never forget what Michelle said and both of you are saying it. It's take advantage of, a, of, of, a, of the interest rate, but build in that buffer. Make sure that buffer exists for you guys uh, because if there is a small change, you do want to be able to sort of live through that change. It's going to come through. Matthew, you've given some really good insight over the last 40-odd 40, 40 minutes and uh, uh, value your sort of input. So I'd love to hear what you have to say in your little wrap-up in a minute and a half, please. Thank you. So well, in closing, I would say that every single person here and every single person listening has one thing in common. We're first and foremost human beings. So don't put the money or the cars or anything else before your experience as a human being. The house, the car, the wife, the kids, it's a means to a happy life. So if you sacrifice your happiness for a house, ask yourself a question. Can you swap the house back for the happiness? If you're sitting in a car for three hours to get to a big fancy house, ask yourself a question. Could you have taken that three hours and sat at a pavement cafe with your family in town and enjoyed yourself? Could you have already been to gym? Could you have already gone and walked on the beach? You've got to balance all the factors and money is not the ultimate goal here. The ultimate goal is living happy, healthy, balanced lives and be brutal about that. Be absolutely uncompromising with your happiness and value time with your family above everything else. Yeah, I think you've missed your calling in life. I thank you. That was, a, that was really good insight and, and, and very good information for our listeners to take away. Haley, you get to have the last word and really sort of wrap this all up and uh, give it down to what your input is and your guidance for, for, for our listeners out there. Thanks, Eugene. Um, I just want to say in closing that probably one of the most important things for a first-time home buyer is also just be prepared and do enough research around pricing understand what's happening around that property that you're looking at. Look at comparable sales. There's so many places that you can get information to help you guide almost price counsel to ensure that you're paying the right price for the property that you're purchasing. There's nothing worse, I think, than paying more than what the property is actually worth. Um, so just something from my side is just look at valuation reports, look at detail around pricing, research, do as much of that as you can before you make that decision. Absolutely agree. The information is there for you to use. So make uh, so please get hold of the relevant people uh, from TPN, from Lifestone. All of those guys can give you massive insights when you're making these decisions. So guys, without without your assistance, we couldn't do these uh, these webinars and these seminars. We've been very grateful to have you on. We value your time and your input. We hope that this has been as good for you guys as it has been for us. So to Andrew, Rob, Michelle, Haley, Matthew, and Mark, thank you very much for joining us. We've really enjoyed this last 45 minutes. Uh, we're going to move over to Ipa Ling. Ipa Ling is going to be dealing with uh, a bit on her own now because she's really going to be uh, taking us into the next part of this conversation, which is acquiring your property. You know, what are, the, what are the facts and fallacies around that particular area? I think it's going to be an interesting debate. So we're going to pop off for a small little video as we change everybody over and we'll see you all on the other side. Thank you, panel, for being part of it. Mm -hmm.